Nothing against smaller people, but if I want help to lift stuff, I want the burly kind. This is the LifeSpring Family Audio Bible coming to you from Riverside, California and podcasting since 2004. I'm your OG Godcaster, Steve Webb. This is the daily podcast where we'll read the entire Bible in a year. I'm so glad you're here today. I'm glad I'm here. Today is Gospel Saturday and we'll read Matthew 11 through 13. I'm calling today's episode, Jesus is a Man's Man. Just a reminder, November 13th will be the 18th anniversary of the very first LifeSpring podcast. When did you start listening to podcasts? How long have you been a LifeSpring family member? When did you first hear one of the LifeSpring shows? Email me at steve at lifespringmedia.com and let me know. Before we read, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you so much and we thank you for your word and we ask you to speak to us and teach us today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you ready? Let's begin. Matthew chapter 11. After Jesus finished telling these things to his 12 followers, he left there and went to the towns in Galilee to teach and preach. John the Baptist was in prison, but he heard about what the Christ was doing. So John sent some of his followers to Jesus. They asked him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we wait for someone else? Jesus answered them, Go tell John what you hear and see. The blind can see, the crippled can walk, and people with skin diseases are healed. The deaf can hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is preached to the poor. Those who do not stumble in their faith because of me are blessed. As John's followers were leaving, Jesus began talking to the people about John. Jesus said, What did you go out into the desert to see? A reed blown by the wind? What did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes live in king's palaces. So why did you go out? To see a prophet? Yes, and I tell you, John is more than a prophet. This was written about him. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way for you. I tell you the truth. John the Baptist is greater than any other person ever born, but even the least important person in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. Since the time John the Baptist came until now, the kingdom of heaven has been going forward in strength, and people have been trying to take it by force. All the prophets and the law of Moses told about what would happen until the time John came. And if you will believe what they said, you will believe that John is Elijah whom they said would come. Let those with ears use them and listen. What can I say about the people of this time? What are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace who call out to each other, We played music for you, but you did not dance. We sang a sad song, but you did not cry. John came and did not eat or drink like other people. So people say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came, eating and drinking, and people say, Look at him. He eats too much and drinks too much wine, and he is a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved to be right by what she does. Then Jesus criticized the cities where he did most of his miracles, because the people did not change their lives and stop sinning. He said, How terrible for you, Chorazin! How terrible for you, Bethsaida! If the same miracles I did in you happened in Tyre and Sidon, Those people would have changed their lives a long time ago. They would have worn rough cloth and put ashes on themselves to show they had changed. But I tell you, on the judgment day, it will be better for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to heaven? No, you will be thrown down to the depths. If the miracles I did in you had happened in Sodom, its people would have stopped sinning, and it would still be a city today. But I tell you, on the judgment day, it will be better for Sodom than for you. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the people who are wise and smart, but you have shown them to those who are like little children. Yes, Father, this is what you really wanted. My Father has given me all things. No one knows the Son except the Father, 
And no one knows the Father except the Son, and those whom the Son chooses to tell. Come to me, all of you who are tired and have heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Accept my teachings and learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in spirit, and you will find rest for your lives. The burden that I ask you to accept is easy. The load I give you to carry is light. Matthew chapter 12 At that time, Jesus was walking through some fields of grain on a Sabbath day. His followers were hungry, so they began to pick the grain and eat it. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to Jesus, Look, your followers are doing what is unlawful to do on the Sabbath day. Jesus answered, Have you not read what David did when he and the people with him were hungry? He went into God's house, and he and those with him ate the holy bread, which was lawful only for priests to eat. And have you not read in the law of Moses that on every Sabbath day the priests in the temple break this law about the Sabbath day? But the priests are not wrong for doing that. I tell you that there is something here that is greater than the temple. The scripture says, I want kindness more than I want animal sacrifices. You don't really know what those words mean. If you understood them, you would not judge those who have done nothing wrong. So the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath day. Jesus left there and went into their synagogue, where there was a man with a crippled hand. They were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they asked him, Is it right to heal on the Sabbath day? Jesus answered, If any of you has a sheep, and it falls into a ditch on the Sabbath day, you will help it out of the ditch. Surely a human being is more important than a sheep. So it is lawful to do good things on the Sabbath day. Then Jesus said to the man with a crippled hand, Hold out your hand. The man held out his hand, and it became well again, like the other hand. But the Pharisees left and made plans to kill Jesus. Jesus knew what the Pharisees were doing, so he left that place. Many people followed him, and he healed all who were sick. But Jesus warned the people not to tell who he was. He did these things to bring about what Isaiah the prophet had said. Here is my servant whom I have chosen. I love him, and I am pleased with him. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will tell of my justice to all people. He will not argue or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. He will not break a crushed blade of grass or put out even a weak flame until he makes justice win the victory. In him will the non-Jewish people find hope. Then some people brought to Jesus a man who was blind and could not talk because he had a demon. Jesus healed the man so that he could talk and see. And the people were amazed and said, Perhaps this man is the son of David. When the Pharisees heard this, they said, Jesus uses the power of Beelzebul, the ruler of demons, to force demons out of people. Jesus knew what the Pharisees were thinking, so he said to them, Every kingdom that is divided against itself will be destroyed, and any city or family that is divided against itself will not continue. And if Satan forces out himself, then Satan is divided against himself, and his kingdom will not continue. You say that I use the power of Beelzebul to force out demons. If that is true, then what power do your people use to force out demons? So they will be your judges. But if I use the power of God's Spirit to force out demons, then the kingdom of God has come to you. If anyone wants to enter a strong person's house and steal his things, he must first tie up the strong person. Then he can steal the things from the house. Whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not work with me is working against me. So I tell you, people can be forgiven for every sin and everything they say against God. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks against the Son of Man can be forgiven. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, now or in the future. If you want good fruit, you must make the tree good. If your tree is not good, it will have bad fruit. A tree is known by the kind of fruit it produces. You snakes, you are evil people, so how can you say anything good? The mouth speaks the things that are in the heart. Good people have good things in their hearts, and so they say good things. But evil people have evil in their hearts, so they say evil things.
And I tell you that on the judgment day, people will be responsible for every careless thing they have said. The words you have said will be used to judge you. Some of your words will prove you right, but some of your words will prove you guilty. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law answered Jesus, saying, Teacher, we want to see you work a miracle as a sign. Jesus answered, Evil and sinful people are the ones who want to see a miracle for a sign, but no sign will be given to them except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Jonah was in the stomach of the big fish for three days and three nights. In the same way, the Son of Man will be in the grave three days and three nights. On the judgment day, the people from Nineveh will stand up with you people who live now, and they will show that you are guilty. When Jonah preached to them, they were sorry and changed their lives. And I tell you that someone greater than Jonah is here. On the judgment day, the Queen of the South will stand up with you people who live today. She will show that you are guilty, because she came from far away to listen to Solomon's wise teaching. And I tell you that someone greater than Solomon is here. When an evil spirit comes out of a person, it travels through dry places, looking for a place to rest, but it doesn't find it. So the spirit says, I will go back to the house I left. When the spirit comes back, it finds the house still empty, swept clean, and made neat. Then the evil spirit goes out and brings seven other spirits, even more evil than it is, and they go in and live there. So the person has even more trouble than before. It is the same way with evil people who live today. While Jesus was talking to the people, his mother and brothers stood outside, trying to find a way to talk to him. Someone told Jesus, Your mother and brothers are standing outside and they want to talk to you. He answered, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Then he pointed to his followers and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. My true brother and sister and mother are those who do what my Father in heaven wants. Matthew chapter 13 That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered around him, so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears let him hear. Then the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given, for to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. And as for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, 
This is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what is sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed seeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also, and the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? They said to him, Yes. And he said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house, who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. And when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there, and coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue, so that they were astonished, and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his home town and in his own household. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Well, family, today I've got thoughts on each of our three chapters. On Matthew 11, some people have the idea that when Jesus was here, he was a milquetoast kind of a guy, a pushover, always soft in word and deed, even weak. These are people who've never read the Bible. At the end of this chapter, verses 28 through 30, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are tired and have heavy loads, and I will give you rest. 
Accept my teachings and learn from me because I am gentle and humble in spirit, and you will find rest for your lives. The burden that I ask you to accept is easy. The load I give you to carry is light. Let's look at these verses, shall we? You know, I can't tell you how many times I've moved or helped friends move in my life. Dozens of times. I've moved from the L.A. area 350 miles north to Mammoth Lakes in the Sierra and back twice. I've lived in homes all around the Southern California area. I moved from L.A. to Orange County and then two or three times within Orange County, then from Orange County to L.A. County again, then to Riverside County, and within Riverside County probably four or five other times, each time with more and more stuff. In all those moves, do you think I looked for the weak guys to help me? No, I've always recruited my strongest friends. Nothing against smaller people, but if I want help to lift stuff, I want the burly kind. Jesus is offering to bear our burdens. I don't know about you, but some of my burdens are anything but light. I'm 67 years old, and some of the burdens I've experienced in my life would have crushed me if I hadn't had Jesus to help me. He bore my heavy loads and gave me a light one in return. No, Jesus is not a milk toast. He is capable of carrying the heaviest of loads. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the beginning and the end. Remember his night in Gethsemane, just before he was going to be arrested and beaten and hung on a cross? He was asking the Father if there's any other way to save us. He knew what was coming, but the only way our sins could be atoned for was the way set out before him. Anyone who could go through with the Father's plan is not weak. Anyone who could survive the flogging he suffered on the day he was crucified is not weak. Anyone who could carry his own cross up the hill after that flogging is not weak. Anyone who could forgive those people that nailed him to the cross or those who mocked him as he hung there is not weak. Anyone who could defeat death and arise the third day is not weak. The Jesus we read about today is a man's man the ultimate leader, and a Savior that I'm happy to serve, follow, and share with anyone who will listen. Thoughts on Matthew chapter 12. In verse 38, some teachers of religious law and Pharisees came to Jesus and said, Teacher, we want you to show us a miraculous sign to prove your authority. Now, on the face of it, this might not seem like a terribly unreasonable request, right? Jesus has made some pretty bold statements. I mean, what gives him the authority to say the things he said? After all, he who makes bold claims has the burden of proof. The thing is, Jesus has already provided that proof. He's already done many miracles, hasn't he? He's healed so many people of a whole host of diseases. He showed that he can control the weather. He turned water to wine. And there's no doubt that reports of his miracles were widely circulated and some of the teachers and Pharisees were eyewitnesses. So what's going on here? Well, here it is. They were demanding that he do something then and there. Of course, they didn't believe that Jesus was God, but can you imagine demanding the creator of all that is that he performed like some dancing monkey? God is God. Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. He is as much God as God the Father or God the Holy Spirit. Together, they're one God, yet each distinct. Jesus' response to them, of course, was swift and piercing. They had seen all that they would need to if they were truly looking for God, but what they really wanted was to maintain the status quo. They didn't like what Jesus had been teaching, and at this point, all they wanted to do was to eliminate him. He was a threat to their authority and their way of life. I'll tell you, my prayer is that my heart remains open to his leading. If there's something that I need to change, I pray that I would always be willing to make whatever adjustments he wants me to. How about you? Let's move to chapter 13. In this chapter and many other places, Jesus refers to the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Did you ever stop to ask what he means by these phrases? Well, I did a bit of digging on the subject and found that this has been a topic of a lot of discussion and commentary over the ages much more than we can cover here, but I did find a very concise answer over at gotquestions.org. Let me share it with you. The kingdom of God is the rule of an eternal, sovereign God over all creatures and all things. Take a look at Psalm 103, verse 19, and Daniel 4, 3. Gotquestions.org continues. The kingdom of God is also the designation for the sphere of salvation entered into at the new birth. John 3, 5 through 7. 
and it's synonymous with the kingdom of heaven. So the kingdom of God embraces all created intelligence, both in heaven and earth, that are willingly subject to the Lord and are in fellowship with Him. The kingdom of God is, therefore, universal in that it includes angels and men. It's eternal, as God is eternal, and it is spiritual, found within all born-again believers. We enter the kingdom of God when we're born again, and we're then part of that kingdom for eternity. It's a relationship born of the Spirit, and we have confident assurance that it is so because the Spirit bears witness with our spirits. Romans 8.16 God is sovereign, omnipotent, omniscient, and the ruler over all of His creation. However, the designation, the kingdom of God, compasses that realm which is subject to God and will be for eternity. The rest of creation will be destroyed. Only that which is part of the kingdom of God will remain. So, I hope the next time you hear the phrase, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, you might have a better understanding. Do you have comments on my comments today? Let me know. Call the LifeSpring Family Hotline at 951-732-8511. And if you're outside the U.S., put a plus one at the beginning of that number. And you can also comment at comment.lifespringmedia.com. And of course, you can always email me at steve at lifespringmedia.com. I'd love to share your comments on the show. Tomorrow is Epistle Sunday, and we'll read Romans 11 and 12. Bust. Bust? Say boost. Boost. I have some people to thank today. LifeSpring family Berean, Brother Paul of Seattle, came in with his weekly $22.22 row of ducks donation, and he's our executive producer today. Thank you, Brother Paul. God bless you. And Mike Hayner came in with his weekly $7.77 striper donation, and he's our associate producer for episode 34 of season 13. Mike, thank you, and God bless you. And longtime LifeSpring family member Kevin Schneider donated $20 with this note. Thanks for coming back for another season. Oh, well, you're welcome, Kevin. It's my honor. I'm glad you're in the LifeSpring family, brother. God bless you. And I'm so thankful for each and every donation, beloved. Just yesterday, I had to renew some security software licenses for the website, and your support helps to keep the website safe. Many other things, too. Thank you. Well, beloved, does the LifeSpring Family Audio Bible help you in any way? If it does, please pray about joining Brother Paul of Seattle, Mike, Kevin, and so many others in supporting what we're doing. I'm helping you read through the Bible in a year, sharing some thoughts that I hope will make you think, perhaps help you to understand a little bit better, encourage you, and inspire a closer walk with God. Please check out LifespringMedia.com support. And know this, your support helps to bring God's Word to people around the world seven days a week. I just looked at some statistics for the show and listened to the top 10 countries where the LifeSpring Family Audio Bible was listened to in the last 30 days. Number one was the U.S., which probably isn't surprising since the U.S. has the largest uh, podcast listening population in the world, I think. Now, but listen to number two. This one really surprised me. I haven't looked at these stats in quite some time, but the number two nation where this show has been listened to in the last 30 days is Nigeria. Wow. That's a surprise. Number three was Canada. Number four was the UK. Number five was Australia. Now listen to six through 10. Norway, India, Singapore, the Netherlands, and Finland. So as you can see from that list, when you help support the show, your impact is felt literally around the world. Beloved, I cannot do this without you. LifespringMedia.com slash support. I'll thank you, and I think God will bless you. Sister Kirsty just sent out another newsletter. Thank you, Kirsty. Brother Sean of San Pedro does the chapters, and he's falling a little bit behind right now with little Howie's entrance into the world, but he assures me that he'll get back to it soon, I think, <laughs> when they start getting a little bit more sleep in the house, perhaps. And Sister Denise corrects the transcripts. I'm so thankful for their donation of time, talent, and treasure. God bless you guys. 
You can comment on the show by calling the LifeSpring family hotline at 951-732-8511, by going to comment.lifespringmedia.com, or by emailing me at steve at lifespringmedia.com. I'd love to hear from you. Until tomorrow, may God bless you richly. Thank you for inviting me into your day. My name is Steve Webb. Bye. Thank you.